Hey guys, Anthony 4 before Diesel. Just wanted to do a very long video. This one's going to be a bit longer, but it's really important. A lot of people have asked for it. And these are the sort of things we're going to try and cover. It's going to be to do with um, batteries, dual batteries, charging systems, wiring, wire size, charges, best way to look, uh, look after batteries, what should be connected to which battery, you know, the main cranking battery or the auxiliary battery. Um, it's not going to be super detailed in different battery types. We'll give you some brief, you know, benefits of using, you know, particular, I suppose, best value for money batteries also and reliability, some really reliable batteries. Um, so a lot to do with all the battery charging setup, why you do and don't need bigger or smaller batteries, heavier batteries, lighter batteries, batteries that, you know, could be dangerous, that sort of thing. So a whole heap of info possibly including um, you know taking into account the situation where guards can crack um, now as all my videos it's not like I've got notes or it's scripted it's all I've been thinking about it for a while what to include um, so we'll, we'll chop a bit of video here or there and um, try and get it together right for you and try and cover everything we need to um, yeah it's all just up here in the processor at the moment so I suppose the first thing we should start off with is talking about uh, the battery. So we'll start at the battery, then we'll go through, you know, the, what you can use to connect the chargers and stuff like that. Um, but let's go batteries first. Um, this is our 120 Prado. And as you can see, there's a couple of Optima batteries there. The reason I like Optima batteries is because somebody, look, I've been in the trade a little while, so I know a few people. Somebody I know worked for a battery company and it was an Optima. And being in the battery industry, he had a fair bit of experience with batteries and stuff. And he thought highly of them. Um, emergency services, I don't know if they still use them, but they were using them. So that they were getting put in those vehicles at the time. Um, I'm not sure what else really. You know, I think they had a three year warranty, which sounded pretty good. You know, in theory, if you do a bit of research on them, they sound pretty good. Um, you get some people you know, complaining about things, but you always get some people complaining about just about everything. So it's a bit disappointing that there's been some people not happy with them for whatever reasons, but that's the idea of the video. We're going to try and cover reasons why it might not have worked out for them and it maybe wasn't the battery's fault. Sometimes it's the fault of, you know, the wiring or the fridge that was used or the lack of ventilation. So we're going to try and cover all that and how important it is. So it's going to be a long one, guys. It's definitely going to be a long one. So if you're not ready for it now, uh, hit pause, save, whatever you want to do to it and put it aside and wait till you go and get a six pack or something <laughs> anyway and um, you're going to need to sit back and relax so there's no point me holding the camera showing you too much here at the moment so I thought I'll just sit it there and hopefully I can concentrate on what I'm trying to say so in our 120 Prado which is a 2008 which um, we've had since 2014 so nearly six years. Shortly after we obtained it, it had a normal, you know, acid battery there. Um, and we were running a Optima yellow top in the previous Prado, um, which we had a really good run out of. And I'll just give you some history on that actually. So that was a new battery um, three years prior. So when we purchased this vehicle, it had another little battery up here, some little, some, look, I don't know, if, I think they, I think it might have been the battery that was in there was rubbish that was dead then it got changed they put a new battery but it was just some small car battery you know whatever to fill the hole it was ridiculous anyway so same as some of the wiring the wiring from here was that look you might think it's ridiculous at the moment it's actually really neat and secure it's not going anywhere nothing here is moving it's rock solid and we're going to cover that and how important all that is and you need to understand your setup where all your wires are how important it is to insulate the wires and have fuses and stuff like that so We'll try and cover everything if I miss something. That's why you subscribe, because we'll do it again later another time anyway. It'll have a different perspective on it, maybe a different vehicle. With this, we're gonna to go to other vehicles as well and show you some different chargers and charger setups. And there is advantages and disadvantages of different chargers, that's for sure. Um, and we're gonna include, talk about that voltage booster diode, which again, some people don't like, but then there's hundreds, if not thousands of people using it successfully, so there you go. But 
there was an old battery in there straight away we took that out and I went well I'll take the yellow Optima out of the um, out of the other car and I'm not sure if I did that the yellow one might have gone in here it might not have actually I might have went actually you know what no I think I tested it it was in really good condition is what I'll say at this point uh, and then I went you know what fresh car fresh battery so what I did I went I'm gonna grab myself a new one now just to give you some information this is a D34M, which is maroon, the blue tops are maroon. Now with the yellow one, the D34, I'm not sure if it's called an M or what, but as long as it's got a light grey case and a yellow top, it's the same battery internal. 34 is the size of these batteries for size. We'll get to more detail. D34M up here. And, um, you know, we, we get these, we've been getting these batteries from every battery for probably about five years or longer now. So that's our battery supplier you don't need to come to me for batteries that's what i'm saying i'll just put it out there every battery in heidelberg's who we deal with i've spoken to the guys they said they'll send batteries out pretty well australia wide sometimes it's 10 bucks 20 bucks whatever depending where you are they've got shops in tassie victoria sydney brisbane i think now they've opened up so they're a growing business they are successful um you get successful from providing good service and they do quantities right so Definitely prices are fair. Obviously, they've got to pay the wages so they can't give stuff away like, um, I don't know who can do that actually. I think their prices are some of the best. Back on topic. So we purchased this batch. I went, okay, we're gonna put one of these in. We'll start fresh because the other one was three years old. Um, put that in and I thought, well, I'm not gonna have that and a, actually, I'm pretty sure I put the yellow one in and I ran that for a few months. I did actually, it was in there for six months. And the two, having two different chemistries, and this is all part of the video, so having two different types of battery can be a problem because it's, let me try and put it in simple terms because remember, there's people out there, I know you know more than me about batteries, no problem, and, but there's a lot of people out there that don't know much about batteries. So what I want to say is the stronger battery may discharge the weaker battery, right? And what generally happens, what I've noticed, is if you've got an Optima, say, as your auxiliary and... Your cranking battery is your main depending where your battery's cut out and that that battery seemed to be sucking out of the cranking battery right so things like that happen right you want to try and keep the same battery chemistry between the two if you can it doesn't matter so much i suppose and depending what sort of charges you've got but i think in my opinion best to keep the same types of battery so i went you know what i had the yellow one here it was working great the cranking one was still working great. It was only about a year old. It had been replaced, but it was one of those black AC Delco. I don't like those batteries, you know. And I, like, I prefer to have, you know, I just want quality, reliable batteries. And we're going to get to why these are so reliable, or that they are so reliable at least soon. I went, you know what? If I'm going to change this battery to an Optima, I want a fresh one up here. So what I did, I just ordered two batteries. And I'll tell you, back then, probably cost me, I don't know, 450, 500, 500, I don't know, either side of 500, circa 500 we'll say, for two batteries, and they're still going, five years old, they're still going, right? And we might get to it in this video where I hit the start key, and you can have a listen to how hard these engines crank with these batteries, okay? Now this might look like a small battery, and people want a bigger one, longer, they want it hitting up on the hose here, getting more heat to the battery, you know? Look, you know, the key is smaller and lighter, um, is, is one, it's not everything, but it's one consideration. This battery, if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, I said, weighs 17 kilos, okay? Which is, it's a good, it's good, that's okay. It's very well secured. We'll talk about the brackets, we'll get to that. 17 kilos, it's 800 cca, which is more than what this engine needs. It cranks like crazy. You hit the key, people hear it. Doesn't matter how new your other whatever battery is, right? And you can spend more money on batteries, but this is the whole point. There's got to be a limit on how much you spend on batteries. You can spend thousands, and they might make quote how many you know cycles you get out of it. You know they might say, oh, this battery you get 500 cycles or whatever it is. I don't know what they quote on that, but I'm just making stuff up. And this battery over here you get a thousand cycles or 1,500 or 2,000 on this one. But if it costs four times as much, was there any real advantage? And what I can tell you is. It's all just numbers. If you look after it, you might get more. This has done a lot more than 500 cycles. Like I said, it's nearly five years old. It's, the fridge is in the car. It's been running 365 days a year for five years. Now, don't be confused. We also put charges and solar and other stuff like that. We don't run it down and kill it unless we're camping. We, we do do that. It's all part of it because that's what we want to do. See how many days and how low it'll run and more detail coming on that. So 
there's a lot of variables. It's not absolutely that's 500 and that's say 300 bucks and this battery over here gets 2000 cycles and it's 1200 bucks or it's a thousand bucks or it's 2000, whatever it is, right? you'll get more cycles at it. It doesn't just stop cycling at 500, okay? So this isn't gonna be as good as a new battery, right? But it still works perfectly fine. It runs a fridge all day, all night, next day, whatever. Depending on the temperatures you're in and temperature you're running the fridge on, again, how well it's ventilated, shade, sun, heat, we'll get to that. It's all part of it. That's why I said long video. So D34M here, just to give Optimus some credit, obviously, the yellow battery being exactly the same as this. The difference is this has got some terminals on it, which are quite handy. That's where you don't have to. You can um, put get a battery terminal and put it on there and connect on there. But I like these terminals, and it allows you to spread it to do that and that if you like. Some people run it off to little fuse boxes and whatever. Look, that's not my preference. You know, in engine bays, they get wet. The terminals are sometimes Chinese quality, and they get all rusty and stuff like that. I like to keep the engine bay clean. I don't wash it down every week, but maybe after every few trips or a few times a year or at a big service. We like to keep it reasonable. Don't get me wrong, it gets a bit of dust on it. You know, there's a bit of muck around it though. It's like gave it a quick rinse because we'd done a few trips and it was quite dusty. It was just a quick rinse off. Um, battery's gotta be secure, that's important, but we'll get to that. So look, that's the battery of choice for this vehicle and I think that would suit most people's needs given if the rest of their setup was right. And here we've got the D34, it's a red top. Red top is your cranking battery, so you cannot use these batteries for um, deep cycle. You'll wreck it. Um, therefore, you don't want to connect anything to that that's going to put a drain on it, because let's get to the next step. So we've talked a little, I suppose we haven't fully covered batteries. There's different types of batteries. I like these batteries. You can use whatever sort of battery you like. To get your best battery information, you should probably talk to the guys at every battery. Travis is at Heidelberg. He, um, he knows batteries pretty well, so have a chat with him. Um, the other battery we like at the moment is the Century Dual Force, which is, it's the, it, they've been designing it for years to compete with these batteries, so that's fine. Uh, we like Century as a brand. Um, they do make good batteries, and we believe the Dual Force is good, and we've got that in um, one of our latest vehicles. So, um, yet to, I'm not going to talk too much about whether I think it's okay or not at the moment. We'll just give it some more time on that one. I think in theory, in the write-up and by the price, I think they're a good battery to own. So certainly, I think give them a go. You can't really go wrong. Um, they do have specials every now and then. I think they retail normally around the $400 mark, but you can get them every now and then on special for $300. So either just buy one, bite the bullet. It's going to last you years anyway. I think they've got a three-year warranty as well, but I'm not sure. Um, and they're a little bit bigger, obviously, for the same sort of money as one of these, you know, bigger in the amp hour capacity, but we'll get to talking about that. I suppose maybe we should do that next. So some people are thinking, ah, oh, that little battery, you know, it's only 55 amp hours, right? Well, that's right, exactly. So for the people that don't know, trying to put it in simple terms, we'll just call this a 55. This has got 55 biscuits in it, if you like, right? 55. Now, when you run your fridge, okay, Generally, it's going to use two and a half, three biscuits an hour when the compressor's running, right? So when the actual compressor's going, brrr, trying to make the fridge cold, and we've got a whole explanation of how fridges, how fridges work. That can be in another video, right? It's all heat transfer, obviously, it uses energy to do that. So we'll explain that again another time. But when your fridge compressor isn't running, it's not using any power, unless you've got a light or something on. It's not using anything. It's off, nothing, zippo, right? So when they quote how many amps it use, it may be what it, the compressor's using when it's running, it may be an average over an hour depending on the temperature, so you've got to watch how they quote it because there's a quite a bit of conniving um, information there trying to make it look like it uses less, this sort of thing. So the way to work out what your fridge uses is to have the compressor running and get someone with some equipment, a multimeter, and put the amps clamp over the wire and measure how many amps are going through it. So let's say that um, a fridge uses, you know, it could be two, two and a half, three amps with a compressor running. Some fridges are up to five amps with a compressor running, even probably some higher, but we're just going on averages here. That's all I said. Let's not get too technical. Let's run, let's talk about, let's do it on two and a half biscuits, right? Two and a half biscuits an hour. So that means how many times does two and a half biscuits go into 55? Well, no, not 55 because you can't use the whole 55. Now, this is one thing good about the Optimus. They're more usable than, say, you know, a normal lead acid battery that you might get for a couple hundred bucks, okay? Those batteries, you might not even really be able to use half the capacity and it's going to damage the battery more by running it that low and lower. 
um, where these deal with that a little bit better, I think. You don't want to run them too low, like just <laughs> 9 volts or 6 volts or something like that. But they don't like that. Um, yeah, we've done that before as well. can't remember how that worked out. I think not so good. That was years ago. Anyway, I just want to say, actually, I know someone that knew of an Optima battery that was 10 years old and still did the job starting cars and going strong. So that's how good they are. Um, I really need to have some notes, don't I? So look, where was I? The battery, 55 amp hours, that's right. So 55, let's say you can probably use about 30. We're gonna say you can use about 30 for argument's sake. It varies, you can push it further. It's still gonna run the fridge. So again, it's just a guide. So if you've got 30 and you, now remember the two and a half biscuits, that's only when the compressor's running. So let's base this on average air temps of your compressor's gonna be running half the time. That's pretty hot, because in colder weather, your compressor's gonna run less. It might be quarter of the time, 10% of the time even, right? Which means it's gonna use bugger all, and the fridge battery's gonna last like four days or something. But if you've got really hot weather, like you're in 45 degree heat, you park the car in the sun, you're not driving, the battery's not getting charged, and you've got it set on freezer because you wanna keep your ice creams cold, and you've got a 60 liter angle, which sucks five amps, and there's no ventilation because you built it into a box, mate, it is gonna cook that battery, mate, six hours, 10 hours, that's where you're gonna have problems. That's a bad setup. So we're gonna talk about good setup. We've gone a little bit off topic, jumped ahead of ourselves trying to paint the picture though, right? So based on an average, two and a half biscuits, two and a half amps for that compressor running, running 50% of the time. Let's just drop it back to an amp to use even numbers. So you're gonna use about one biscuit an hour, right? One biscuit an hour in your average temperature. You know, you've had a 25, 30 degree day. It's gonna cool down at night, you know, to 20, 15 degrees, whatever. But during the day it's, you know, and look, you're probably driving anyway, that's the thing. But let's just pretend we're not driving, whatever. The battery, we park the car at lunchtime and the battery's sitting there, right? All afternoon in the sun. Obviously the best thing you do is keep the fridge ventilated, the back door open, in the shade, whatever. If you're not driving, I'd assume usually you're gonna be maybe near the vehicle where you can leave it open. So do things like that. Don't leave it sitting in the sun. Fridge manufacturers make fridges the wrong color. They should be white, so they reflect all the heat. I don't know what they're thinking, but anyway, that's another story. We don't really need to do that one in this video. So one biscuit an hour, 30 biscuits, you got it, that's 30 hours. That's how long this battery is gonna last. It's not gonna, well, depends what fridge you got, it may cut out, but that's what it's gonna last. So if you park at lunchtime, the fridge is gonna run till dinner time the next day, right? 24 hours is lunchtime, another six hours. So that's how long that battery is gonna last, roughly in those conditions, okay? Now, if the weather's cooler, I'll give you some examples. We, we've done this testing where, you know, up in the Kimberleys in 30 odd degree days, um, and it cools down to a bit under 20 at night, we've parked vehicles in the afternoon, we've let them sit there, run all night, run all day, run all night, fridge is still running the next day. So that's two nights. And that's because obviously we're doing walks and stuff like that, so we don't need to run the vehicle. Now, the point I'd like to make why you don't need a bigger battery is because generally you don't do that. Generally you're driving the vehicle each day, whether it's to go get some firewood or to drive down to a water hole to go for a swim 10Ks, and that's the point I'd like to make about the Optimus, they recover really quickly. If you've got other types of batteries sometimes um, without spending a lot of money, you can drive for half an hour and you're only going to sort of get another 10, 20% into the battery. These things, you run them for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, the battery's like 90% plus. It's just amazing how quick they recover, okay? So um, I, don't, I haven't got exact numbers on it, but I can tell you that if I run this, you know, let's go get some firewood, come back 20 minutes later, the battery can be from sitting down near 12 volts, cactus, you know, as in, you know, it's getting low, it's been running a couple of days, and it's up sitting, and, you know, after it's settled, it's still up around, you know, 12.8 volts, that sort of thing. It's really done a massive recovery, 80%, 90%. Again, depending on how long you've driven for. Really good recovery time, okay? So that's one of the key things. So the point I'd like to make, you don't need a massive, big, heavy battery and carry all that weight around is one thing. Putting it over your guard, it's just thin steel. You know what I mean? They do crack, okay? Some of the later vehicles have been changed. Different vehicles have different issues, but we're talking the Prados up until, look, you know, in the last few years, they've had some extra strengthening and built-in brackets and stuff that make it a lot stronger. Uh, probably 2014, 15. So it just got better over the years, so they changed it. So there's no absolute. It doesn't mean they all crack guards and that's a big problem. You can have cracks there. 
and it's no big deal you know you drill the hole at the end of it it stops and that's it just keep driving it's not a big panic some people want to make a big deal out of it it's certainly not a big deal but the lighter and the most secure is the best so they recover quickly you've got an idea of the biscuits they use right so 55 you can use 30 you're going to use 30 in a day or two right now if it's hotter you, you park the vehicle at 3 o'clock in the afternoon by 3 o'clock the next day if it's 45 if you're out in the Simpson Desert and you're not well I don't know why you'd be in the Simpson Desert not driving so I'll say our use where we use these vehicles and every example I can think of makes this information correct because why would you be anywhere in 45 degree heat just sitting there mate you are cooking I don't know I'm not going for a walk mate it's not happening okay he's going for a walk in 45 degrees that sun beating down on you not happening I'm in the car engines running we're cruising mate scenery out the window and it's about 22 degrees in the cabin happy days right then four o'clock five o'clock in the afternoon when things cool down then we're going to stop put new awning out get some shade for the last bit set up camp right then you can go for a walk and have a look at something later on when it cools down Guess what? The battery's fine overnight. Next morning, it's still going to be on 12 and a half volts, mate. It's only used 20%, right? So I hope you get what I mean. These are really reliable because of the spiral cell technology. They're really strong. So you can take them down corrugated tracks, hammer the absolute death out of them, or the life out of them, to death, whatever it is. And they, they're just reliable. They keep going. Where other batteries, they can fall to pieces, literally fall to pieces inside. Um, and of course fluid and stuff leaking out. These are a dry battery. That's what AGM absorb glass mat So they're dry. There's no acid anywhere to leak up. You can mount them sideways You can put them in the car probably the safest battery to put inside the vehicle If you wanted it some people don't want to have batteries up here because they're too worried about the guard cracking Well, that's good if you're a solo traveler or two people and you can afford the space in the back of the vehicle or you're hauling some massive big camper or caravan around because look some people do that that's their choice but for us when you're going to remote places you can't always take trailers and stuff like that travel light camping out back you know travel light we need to have the battery under the bonnet because we need every cubic inch of space in the back of the vehicle because it's a family thing you know what i mean you, you just need to fit everything in so another battery and charges and compressors and things you just don't need taking up space they all stay under the bonnet so i reckon that's given my reasons why I like Optimas and why they do the job. Now, some of the problems that might seem the battery that aren't the battery are charging systems. Um, and we'll, we're not going to go into DC DC charges yet, but sometimes they can be the problem because <clears throat> they can actually downgrade the charge compared to what a charge from an alternator can be direct to the battery believe it or not you know so you think you're doing the right thing you've done your homework but it's not always the best option we'll get to that um what what what's the biggest reasons why people probably think you know oh, that piece of crap didn't work out for me or whatever well as i said the fridge types okay so if you've got big fridge a big fridge or fridges can be a problem um if it's the wrong color if it's out in the hot sun if it's really big it uses a lot of power you know that compressor whatever it's using you've just got an animal there this is why travel light small less is more less is best kind of thing you know um, having it built into a box right so heat trip we'll just touch on it you know the way the fridge works is you know it's got what's called an evaporator inside that's the cold part and a condenser outside that's the hot part the, the heat needs to be dispersed off the condenser by way of airflow. It's got a fan there. If you've got a fridge built in a box and it can't get any airflow, that's going to cook. The efficiency is going to go down the drain. So the compressor is going to run forever because it's never going to get to the temperature you've got it set on. And this is why running it on freezer is not the best either. Now, funnily enough, there's canned foods. I just want to put it out there. You don't have to go and cook all these extravagant meals. You can do that at home. You don't have to cryovac by all these machines cryovac and then it's just plastic waste right so more waste to the environment more money that you spent you just buy cans mate, on special half price dollar seventy bada bing there's a meal doesn't need to go in the fridge three and a half four five serves of veggies don't tell me it's bad for you actually tastes good if you don't eat it all year round you'll be going this is awesome if you're hungry you'll eat it you'll love it full of veggies right less than three grams of sugar per hundred, less than um, three grams of fat per hundred, and less than 300 milligrams of sodium per hundred. There you go, there you go. They're the ones you want, okay? That's what you eat, right? You know, 
You can take some other meals as well, of course, but this is the whole point. Your fridge at home is 400, 500 litres, I don't know, 300 or 600. You're not gonna be able to eat when you go away like you do at home and you don't need all those things. Most of the stuff in your fridge you don't need. It's ridiculous, right? But if you're trying to eat right and fresh food is best, you're gonna to have to substitute a little bit of that. Buy some stuff that you don't need to keep in a fridge, right? Apples don't need to go in the fridge, do they, right? Tomatoes, if you buy the right ones, they don't have to go in the fridge for a few days. It depends what town you go through. You can stock up. Some tomatoes need to left out to ripen up. So something to think about, right? Big fridges suck the juice. That means you're going to need a big battery. And you just, okay, that's cool. But you're carrying a heap of weight. So you can do it, absolutely. If that's what you want to do, go ahead and do it. But for us, we choose the travel light, small, reliable, compact, and these batteries do the job. So each to their own. But what I will say is, if you're driving it every day, there's still no reason why a battery like this is not gonna run the fridge all night, okay? Because it cools down at night, the sun's not there at night, you haven't got the heat of the vehicle at night, um, and then you're driving again the next day. And if you're not, that's where these things called solar panels come in, okay? So there's lots of different size solar panels, so I'm just gonna have a think, make sure we're sort of done with the, well, I think we're done with the battery side of it and why that size will do, why we like those brands. You can use whatever you want. I'm just giving you information. There's a lot of information here for people that want it. A lot of people have got no idea, right? So, and I've probably got no idea for some of you as well. You know, you've got more of an idea, but that's cool, right? This is to help the people that want the help. So, so let's go into solar panels next, I reckon. Let's touch on solar panels because we've just said it. Solar panels, right. You know, these days you can get cheap ones that do the job sometimes. Now, there's the important part, do the job sometimes. You can get cheap ones, a couple hundred bucks, whatever. You can get, even get panels for close to a hundred bucks. Now, the big folding panels with the aluminium frame, aluminium, whatever you want to call it, they're probably the best as in value for money, and you've got your bigger panel there. They're gonna work the best. So if you've got room for those, then that's what you use. Um, I'm gonna take a break. And then we're going to come back on solar panels, all right? So that's what we're going to do. All right, so let's move on a bit of chit-chat about solar panels, different solar panels and what they do, what you can expect from those, because it does vary quite a bit, as I may have mentioned, but I can't remember. Um, doesn't really matter. Let's not go too much into brands. We'll just go, you know, you've got cheaper options and more expensive options, and sometimes that works out better. All depends how much you're going to use them and um, what you expect you know if you want to get the maximum output and you're going to use them a lot then it's better to spend some more money and get better quality you know the poor man pays twice thing so um, but then you've got some cheap ones that'll do the job at least most of the time not all of the time and i suppose the first thing we'll do is back to basics as i said previously i think the best solar panels are the big panels on the aluminium frame you've got two big panels or one or whatever you've got right you've got a bigger area it's going to capture more they're more reliable because you don't have the joins in between like you do with these which seem to be very fairly reliable but i think that's better with those panels when i owned those and i don't anymore those bigger ones we never had any issues with um low charge with regulators and stuff like that cutting out and reducing charge and stuff like that which is what we're seeing with some of these panels so we've had a few issues with these like i said we're not going to go into what brands are you might be able to figure it out but it doesn't really matter because they just come out of the same factory in china as other brands again and whatever so we could say you know these are kings or they're not but it doesn't matter because other brands that you get the same product different name so you're going to have similar issues what we've noticed is well, firstly these are 120 watt panels 120 watt panels have kind of been around for years as in been value for money for quite a few years you can go 140 160 you can go 200 250 where does it end and i'd suggest that you're meant to be camping that means travel light take less smaller fridges back to basics and smaller solar panels will do so around the 120 to 160 watt would normally be enough if you're going to take two fridges both 60 liter one's a fridge one's a freezer and you know you're just going to sit there and not drive you got some batteries you might want to take a 250 watt panel because you know everything but the kitchen sink if you're going to run an aircon or something you might need even more 
things people do, each to their own. So these are 120 watt panels, I think they're good value for money. What a 120 or 140 watt they're about panel puts out. Best case scenario, look, I'm not gonna give you exacts. Again, it's general information. You know, six to eight amps, somewhere in that sort of vicinity on a nice, you know, sunny day where no cloud, um, for while the sun's on them fairly directly, you're gonna get around, you know, six to eight is the maximum you're gonna get generally. Um, and when you get a bit of cloud and stuff, you're going to be down to about, um, you know, one, one and a half, two. It depends how cloudy it is, right? Sometimes it's just crazy. Sometimes it's cloudy and you, you still be getting heaps, like, and the voltage will be right up there, up above 14. Um, that's what I mean. But the other thing we're seeing, the problem we're seeing is, I believe it's these regulators can't handle it or they're not set up for it. Basically, when things get really hot, and you, I'm not blaming the panels, like, we could say, when they get really hot and the sun's on them, those 35, 40, 45 degree days, instead of the voltage that previously we'd seen up in the 14 range, 14, 2, 14, 5, 14, 7, whatever it might be, with these basic regulators, you can see on the left side of the picture, see so just over here, you've got the grey one and the blue one. Very similar, they look different, but similar. They do the same thing, basically, more or less. Um, what we're seeing happen is, you know, it's all charging up, no worries, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. But when it gets to 11 or 12 and things are really hot, it drops back to about 13, 2, 13, 3, 13, 4 is a, quite a common voltage. And, you know, we weren't sure if there's something wrong with the panels. And we found a number of problems with this set of panels, okay? So with that extension over there, I think it was that one, one of the Anderson plug fittings had a terminal in back the front, so that was one problem we found. That wasn't on one of those actually, that was on, uh, might have been the other extension. Anyway, point is, what comes with it? One terminal was in back the front. Another one, there was nothing. It was that 10 meter actually, there was nothing coming through it whatsoever. We traced it back and found a break in the um, copper. It was broken all the way through where it was uh, the terminal at the end of the plug there. So basically, you know, with a test slot or, you know, multimeter, whatever, beep, 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 beep. And guess what? There was power all the way up there, but not to the terminal. So we ripped the plug and the terminal off and basically ripped it off, pulled it off, and then the plastic broke. That's all that was left holding it. The copper was broken. So you've got to watch out for stuff like that, probably with your cheap stuff, probably not with your better quality stuff, you know what I mean, but maybe. Um, so, yeah, have little issues like that. So once we sorted all that out, got the terminals around the right way and sorted out all the broken wires and... They sent us another regulator, another one of those blue regulators there, like that blue one. We've got two of those for this set of panels. Didn't make any difference, by the way. Both the regulators, including this regulator that's off another set of brand panels, right? So we've got a couple of sets of solar panels. They will do the same thing, right? Both sets of panels with these regulators. And we're going to get to a solution later on the video, so information, information. But both sets of panels with these regulators were cutting out once they got hot. Actually, I think maybe the other set, the better quality panels didn't. You know, I'm gonna to have to do a bit more on this, but 100% this set of panels with both those regulators were cutting out once they got hot. Can't remember with the other one, actually. So I'll, the jury's out on that one. I've got to do further testing, can't remember. Too much mucking around different panels and batteries and plugs and regulators and whatever. So this will, 120 to 160 watt is plenty. It'll suffice to put in so to give you an idea, okay, so if you're getting, let's say you're only getting four amps, okay? Let's say you're only half cloud, half sun, you get an average of about four amps. Remember we talked about the biscuits earlier, so four biscuits. So the fridge was using, you know, if on an average climate, it's gonna use about one biscuit an hour. Well, then this is gonna put in minimum one biscuit an hour. Even if it's cloudy, it's gonna put in the biscuit you're using. You get what I mean? So if it's cloudy. Now, where you've got a problem with these panels as well is block one panel, block that. If there's a tree branch or something blocking that, like that, just like that, boof. When that's there like that, you've just lost your panels, the whole lot. Yep, believe it or not, that's in testing what we found. If we put something and went, boof, block that, you've lost the lot, okay? Basically, if it's not all of it, it was you've lost 90% of the lot because the voltage just went straight down to battery voltage, charge volts, whatever. Um, so be aware of that. This is some of the problems you can have, and we're going to get to 
you know, people that want to mount them permanently on the roof and the solution around these issues, all right? So we'll probably get to that shortly. Now, we're not going to go on to other, there's other charges, other charge controls that work a lot better than these standard ones that come with any solar panels, okay? So you can use these. Generally, they do the job, but using a um, proper solar crap charge controller is going to be of benefit. Um, now, let's just quickly talk about solar. Pa so we've talked about the size, 121, 41, 60. They should do the job. That'll, that's going to cover you for, you know, if you're at camp and you're just sitting there for four days or something like that, and you're not going to go get any firewood, you know, that half an hour run time to charge your top up your battery or whatever. So you chuck your solar out, right? And you can put on your, if you've got a flat... Um, roof platform or whatever you can sit them up on the roof temporarily or you can lay them on the ground whatever you want you can move them around chase the sun as much as you like but if you're getting good charge you only need them out for a couple hours at the end of the day and it's going to top up you know what you've had so if you've got them out all day you're going to have heaps it's not something to worry about if it's cold raining wet you're going to struggle because once it's actually raining that sort of cloud it's thick you're not getting much through you're not going to get much at all so that's where you're going to struggle you're going to need to go for a drop and go get some firewood so there's a lot of people that want to permanently mount solar panels and think maybe that's a good idea to permanently mount solar panels on the roof well think about this as i said you block part of it you lose it so if you've got something up there on the roof a swag on half of it it's not like you're going to lose half your panels right so you've basically just spent thousands of dollars getting a nice platform on your roof so you can put your solar panel on there it just sounds like an expensive exercise for something that's not needed now just remembering, keeping in mind, the sun wrecks everything. Um, you'd have to then park your vehicle in the sun all the time to get the benefit of the sun to charge your battery to keep your fridge running. I really think you're much better off. The fridges run much more efficiently on 240 volt. Park the car in the shade and plug it in on the charger and we're gonna to get to charges. That's the next step, okay? So putting a solar panel on, quite often when you're camping, there's trees around, you're not going to, there's hills, you're not going to just get the sun and you're not going to be able to park the vehicle. It limits you to where you're going to get your sun. When you're at home, when you're at work, are you parked in the sun? Are you parked in the shade? Do you really need your fridge running? Is it worth having your fridge running on 40 degree days, which is 60 or 70 plus in the car? It's cooking in there. The fridge is running. It's cooking. It's, it's wrecking your battery. Literally, it is cycling your battery. It is running it right down. Then you drive home. 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, I don't really care, depending on what sort of batteries you've got, they're not gonna recover in that time, okay, from a DC sort of charge from your alternator. Um, so, not advisable. What you've really gotta do is switch off your fridge when you're not using it, leave it open, take it out of the vehicle, and why carry the weight around? Um, we leave ours in the vehicle and we leave it always on, because hey, we're testing the angle fridge, we're seeing how long it's gonna run for, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for how many years? But of course, when we if it's winter, we may leave the vehicle for a day because it doesn't run the battery down much at all. It'll still be up around mid 12s and above. So without any load that is, right? So when the compressor of the fridge is not running, it comes back to 12.5, 12.6, happy days. If you're running it overnight and it's running it down to 12 every day, it's running the battery right down quite a bit. I'd rather not do that. Of course, that's what you do when you go away, you're camping or whatever, but I'm not gonna do that every day of the year because it's gonna kill the battery. So what you do, you plug it in on the charger. We've got a setup in the 120 that's got, it's actually got a power board there. There's a small charger there, which I'll show you later in the video, and I'm not recommending any particular brands to or from or not. I'll probably give you some recommendations on who to talk to and they should give you the right advice. I might mention a couple of brands, what I like, but um, some options anyway. So. You know, the charger plugs into the power board, the fridge plugs into the power board, it's really neatly wired. I can't stand contraptions where fridge wires are, you know, all over the place and getting dragged and nearly jammed and you've got to manually tuck wires in and stuff with your contraption of a fridge and fridge drop down slide and all that. It's just an absolute mess. It's got to be neatly done, easy to use. It's called ergonomic, right? Nice, neat, and that's the setup we've got. You can pull the fridge in and out. You don't have to worry about the wires ever. They're all permanently set up with corrugated split tubing. They can flex and move exactly where they need to. They're not going to get caught up by anything. The last thing you want on a trip is to get a damaged wire, a short, a car fire, or a fridge that's not working, any of that. No fun, right? So it's got to be done reliably. It's got to be solid, the setup, okay? So basically... Where was I? What, what, what point was I trying to make? Okay, so, <laughs> totally, totally lost it. So 
that's right, the charger. So plugged in at the back, the charger is charging the battery, okay, and the power, the 240 volts running the fridge, all right? That's the most efficient cost bugger all to run because the fridge is so small, right? Um, you look at your house fridge, it's running 24-7. It's not a massive part of your electricity bill. And don't get me wrong, it is a big part because it's 24-7, 365, but these small fridges on 240 volt, a lot more efficient. I think it uses like two or three times more power one way or the other to run it off the battery. So certainly test your batteries, but test them on a camping trip is the way to do it. Don't, you know, there's no need to, I really just want to make a strong point because there's people we know over the years that want to run their fridges all the time. They think they've got the they're going to spend you know four figures on a um, battery setup got their fridge their fridge slide their drawers whatever and they just want it on all the time and they don't know to keep it on the charger they haven't thought that going to work and back and you and i don't care if you think you've got a dc dc charger you spend all the money on that a red arc or a projector whatever you want it doesn't make it that much better that you can do that okay and the other thing is sometimes it's not as good and we're going to get to that we haven't got to charging yet so we're going to go through all the different charging options i just wanted to cover batteries first i think we've i think i've said enough about solar panels um like i said this is a cheap set we've got another set there they're 160 watts um they uh look they're a quality set of, look i'll tell you where you can get those because at the end of the day um we know the guys there they get them manufactured in the same factory as the Red Arc ones, which we believe is a good brand and quality products. Um, but they apparently were told they had some issues, some small issues. So the manufacturer changed things. And the way these went, look, the brand Samson, and you can get those from Malandi Outdoor Adventure. So M-A-L-A-N-D-Y, Malandi Outdoor Adventure. They're in Thomastown in Melbourne in Victoria for anyone that's around the area. Or uh, even if you're not, they send stuff Australia-wide, I believe. Um, they're at most of all the four-wheel drive shows and stuff like that around the country. So keep an eye out for Melandi. That's Mel and Andy, funnily enough. So they've got the Samson panels. They look and seem to be a really quality um, panel. Um, so if you're going to buy something you want to keep to last long term, just quality, top quality. You look at the wire quality, right? When I go and look at these, these panels and this wire that comes out here and the joins and stuff, it's like, geez, I don't know, what are we going to get a couple of years out of them before it breaks off? I've had cheap panels before, and you use them out in the weather a bit, right? So they're out there in the dust every now and then it rains, a bit of moisture gets into the wire, and that caught the wire, it just sort of corrodes away and breaks away, and before you know it, you've got no connection. I could be wrong, but from what I'm looking at, the wire, the quality of the wire on those Samson panels is awesome, mate. So I'm, I'm impressed with the product. Um, if you, I'm just letting you know, so there's your options. You can go get some cheap, you know, you can go get some Kings or whatever you want if you want, or you can go get some quality, right? It's a different market. If you want cheap and hopefully get a couple of years or so out of them and you're happy to keep doing that every few years, go for it. If you want to get a quality set, you're going to spend six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars whatever it is. Hopefully they'll last your lifetime. That's the plan, but time will tell. Go and get a set and we'll find out, eh? So I think the Big folding solar panels in that aluminum frame. So I like to say it different ways for you, just you know, depending where you're from, whether you like it or not. Aluminium frame, right? Um, I think they're much more efficient and they're better if you've got room to fit those. These are for people that haven't got room. They want small and compact, um, like myself. You know, we're using a vehicle. We've got to fit the family in. Every cubic inch of space counts. And a lot of trips we don't take these because they're just not needed. We're driving every day. Personally, generally, we don't need solar. It's only if we sit somewhere base camp, and we do that sometimes, a couple of times a year, we use them for a few days, right? So we've got a cheap set for that, and we've got a good set, obviously, to test and compare, and we'll keep doing so. So there'll be more videos with updated information. As we learn, we share it with you. Now, I think what we need to do, I'll take a bit of a break again, and then we'll uh, talk about some ch all the different charging systems, the alternator, the DC-DC chargers, you know, the AC chargers, and all that sort of thing. Um, I probably haven't covered something, as I've said before. I'm sure these people that know more than me about it, but I'm just trying to share my knowledge with you because I've got a bit of a bit of experience and a bit of information there. And from talking to people, I've realised a lot of people don't understand a lot of this. So hopefully, it's helpful for a lot of you. Back with you soon. All right. So there's lots of different battery chargers available, and again, I don't really care about brands at this point. I'm just more about value for money. Things that work seem to be reliable. 
Um, you get a charger like this, you can get it from just about anywhere, right? You can talk to every battery in Heidelberg and see if they've got one. I'm not sure if they got them on the shelf or not. I'm pretty sure this one came from Bunnings and they were about 64 bucks at the time, but I have noticed they've gone up. So, hey, check with check elsewhere. Give um, every battery a call and ask them if they haven't got one. Why not? Can you get me one in? Anthony said you should have them on the shelf. Um, I think they'd be pretty happy with that device, but you know, could be wrong. Um, I like these chargers because you can just leave them plugged in. So they do the job to get the battery up to where it needs to be. I think it says for lead acid batteries only, whatever. I'm not too fussed about that. It does the job. Um, you know, some people won't like it because blah, 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 whatever. It just doesn't matter, right? This is what's been maintaining our Optima batteries in the 120 for five years. There's one mounted in the vehicle. So we've got one here in the workshop. We've got some other charges as well, but there's one here in the workshop. This is really, like it says there, charge and maintain, right? So you could plug it in and just leave it plugged in. It's not gonna hurt or overcharge the battery, right? Um, it comes with, you can, it comes with eye terminals that you can connect directly to your battery or you can use those if it's a temporary situation. An extension lead, because this is pretty short, which is nice and neat. It's in the 120, we've just obviously cut that off and hardwired that and as I said this is the short plug nice and neat bang and look there's people like um, some trailer man Australian trailer manufacturers and stuff use them leave them permanently mounted in their trailers same thing they've got a battery in there and to run lights and fridges and whatever so when you're parked or when you're at a caravan park or whatever you just plug that in so that was the kind of idea but of course we didn't want to do two plugs we want to do one plug so We've got one plug out of the vehicle that runs the charger, the fridge on 240 volt, and there's still two spare plugs if we want to plug and charge something else, but rarely gets plugged in that way anyway, other than at home to maintain the battery. Um, these do get warm, that is normal. You can feel them get a bit warm, uh, particularly in the first phase of charging. Um, when you first start charging, I'm not here to tell you exactly how the charger works, but um, it red when it's charging, right? And as it goes green after a while fully charged it says and that's doing the maintenance so you just leave it connected so it's kind of still it is still charging but it's just trickle charging really slowly it's going to keep the voltage somewhere above 13 you know thereabouts and it's perfectly good to keep your battery at that level that's what you want that's the best way to look after a battery and maybe that's why my Optima's are about five years old and still looking good um, you can wire it directly to your auxiliary battery or you can go to your main cranking battery which will in turn then connect your isolator and charge both of them even better. So whichever way you want to do it. I think mine I've got it wired to the auxiliary battery. If I want to charge the um, cranking battery then that little wire, is, I've got an SB, we're going to get to this soon, we've got an S, what is it, an SB112 or an SBI12, whatever it is, those, those things anyway, the main red arc one, you know, they. You get them on eBay for 150 bucks. I don't know. That's probably they used to be under 100. I know retail's a couple hundred bucks, but you know that's up there a bit. So you want to shop those a bit as well. Um, I do like those. They're very reliable. A lot of vehicles have got them, um, and we do log Red Arc as a brand, especially Australian-made stuff. So with that, you can connect. There's a blue wire that you can run into the vehicle. Um, that you press a button to connect the two together. We haven't got it set up that way We've got it set up just with a little alligator clip and it's short and we just touch that anywhere on Positive of the you know auxiliary battery and then it connects that isolated to the two so it charges both So we do it that way you just temporarily touch it they connect the charge starts and then you can take it off again So it's ready to disconnect at a later date when you you know stop charging or whatever so that charger is what we like. For, this is the maintenance charger. I suppose we'd recommend something like that. And it's a small investment, 60 or 70 bucks, to look after your batteries. And it's something like that's probably going to last you forever. It's nice and compact. It's not one of those ones, big, bulky, whatever. So, look, I like them. Let's move on to some other types of charging. So we'll just run through some other charging systems. Um, on the 120, as we already mentioned, um, it came with a... ARB battery tray and the Red Arc SB112 or the SBI12. I can't, look, I don't know if the part number changed. I think the, the unit changed. I'm certainly not an expert on the part numbers and what that unit is, and I don't generally install dual battery systems and stuff. It's just to our own vehicles. Um, but we've got that SB whatever 12 unit in the 120. 
it has worked reliably, obviously, for uh, coming on 12 years. The vehicle's going to be, what, no, 10, 10, what is it? 2008, 8, 9, it's 20 now, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, well, <laughs> you can work it out coming up to 12 years, I guess. Uh, reliably for that long, we see those units on a lot of vehicles. They were a traditional thing that people have used for years and years and always seem to be very reliable. We don't really hear about any issues with those. We do hear of some reliability issues with some other brands, those cheaper brands. We don't bother naming We prefer to be positive. We just want to give you the good information. Don't worry about the, the negative and the parts that don't work out so well. Um, so that, I still think that's a really reliable setup. Now, there's a lot of talk about smart alternators and variable charge rate alternators and all sorts of things. Now, every vehicle's different, and I think this is where you know things get a bit mixed up because people, they get some information on one alternator, and then they try and take it to another vehicle, and that's wrong, and then, you know, someone says something, and if you're talking to the wrong people, you know, don't take it as gospel. You've got to do your own research a little bit. Read some books, guys. Read some books. Um, get it from the manufacturers. Um, and not necessarily the manufacturers of the chargers, because remember, they do want to sell you a charger. Um, this is what I've noticed, okay? So with, with the 120s and the 150s, generally, you know, they do, the, the charge rate does vary. Usually, I won't say always, usually for the first part of charge, it'll be charging up around the high 13s, maybe even into the low 14s, and they generally drop down after a while. And you can see them go as low as, and when I say low, you got to take into account you do get the variable charge rate at idle and with headlights on and all that so it can drop down even more but i'm talking about with no load on with a warm engine and you know if we need to let's keep it up to a thousand revs so we don't get that little drop off as it comes back to idle so a thousand revs even they they sort of, or driving along you know 1500 revs you cruising along whatever you generally see them come down around the 13.3 13.4 13 13.2 13 somewhere there right now, there's this voltage booster diode, which a lot of people don't like, but you've got to remember, a lot of the people that don't like it, they're the people that want to sell you something else as well, right? So, please understand, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people with these voltage booster diodes in vehicles, and, you know, they can, there's all these scary stories about cars burning. Look, they've got a fuse built into them and whatever anyway, so you just got to be careful of who you listen to. Um... You've just got to obviously make sure it's a quality product. It's made safe by having the fuse in it still anyway, right? We've run one in the 120 for as long, about the five year thing, as long as you know, whatever it is, the batteries and the everything's been happening. And at the same time, we put about four in other vehicles of people we know, close customers or friends with Prados, and they're still working. Their cars haven't burnt to the ground either, along with the hundreds or thousands of other people over the years that have used them also. Now, what you get from that is, is about an extra half to 0.6 of a volt, I've noticed, it increases, so it still varies, so it's still a variable alternator and all that, so sometimes you might see as high as 14.5 volts, but more commonly just over 14, 14.2, 14.3, which is really good, and then when it drops down, you're still seeing about 13.8, right? So thereabouts, give or take, you know, a little bit, and it works really well. It's helped our batteries, the Optimas, last five years. When we go out on trips, as I said, they recover really quickly. So without a DC-DC charger, they recover really quickly, those batteries, right? Regardless, the batteries have lasted five years, so they last a long time, as in lifetime. The batteries last a long time cycling, and then when we run the vehicle, the Optima batteries recover quickly, so they're super reliable, they don't break and fall to pieces. So they're reliable that way, and they recover quickly, including not using an expensive DC-DC charger. Now, I'm not telling you not to buy one. I'm just telling you what we're seeing and keep what, hang on because there's a bit more. The people that watch till the end, they're the ones that are going to get the info, right? So I like that setup. I've got to say it's cheap, it's reliable. There's a lot of other benefits. When you run an SBI-12, you can have big thick cables, a short distance battery to battery in your engine bay, and you can connect that and use it for jump starting. In case for some reason you leave your door open, a light on, and your cranking battery goes flat overnight, well, hopefully your good auxiliary battery, your good Optima, has still got 80%, 70%, and by connecting that little blue wire we're talking about, whether it's a switch in the car or a set of alligator clips or however you've got it set up, we may get to showing you on the 120 what I'm talking about. 
trying to keep. Oh, I did say I'm going to make a long video. That's because there's a lot of information, and I could break this up into little stages and whatever. But let's just keep it simple and just keep it all in one big video for people that want this info. So they're the advantages. You can easily it'll automatically connect and disconnect, smart alternator or not. Okay, simple as that. When it gets to about 12.8, I'm, I'm going to give you about figures. I can't even remember. Okay, you know they're meant to connect when it gets up to about 13. Point two or three, somewhere around there. Most of these voltage sensitive relays is what they're called, technically. They connect about then and they cut out at about 12.8. This is the specification on most of them. I'm talking averages, not exact on any particular one. Now the red arc, it might not connect and disconnect at exactly what they say or what anyone else says, but it doesn't matter. It connects at a sufficient voltage, that's when you start the car, and it disconnects sometime afterwards, depending how good your battery is. If you've got two really good well charged batteries, it could stay connected for a couple of hours. But it disconnects when your cranking battery gets down to about 12.7, 12.8, which has still got heaps to start the car the next morning, okay? Rest assured, okay? It works really well, especially with the Optimas, with our delete. So that's your cheapest setup. It's got the advantage of being able to jump start the battery, which is really good. Um, and you can manually just connect the two for using a charger like this. Now, this vehicle, we're running a DC-DC charger, right? So, because pe people say, you know, you got this uh, smart alternator, you need it. This is what I can tell you, right? We've got a voltmeter in the vehicle that tells us what this alternator is punching out. And what I can't remember is how variable it is, but what I can tell you is shortly after the vehicle's been running a while, until an hour, three hours, five hours, or the end of the day, I don't care, it puts out 13.7 or 13.8 to my display in the vehicle. It doesn't change, okay? So if you were to use an SBI 12, that would be sufficient charge to charge your second battery under the bonnet, okay? It would be. Now, this is what we see from this DC-DC charger so far. So this is a projector unit. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm saying it's a projector unit. It's an option, okay, available at every battery where this one was purchased. Now, basically, what we're seeing is this, okay? Remember, the alternator's putting out 13.8, thereabouts, more or less, you know, it varies a little bit. I can't remember what it is right at the start, whatever, you know? But whenever we look at it, any other time during the day, 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, an hour later, at the end of the day, 13.7 or 13.8 is what's on the display okay what's happening with this well for the first little while okay this unit pumps about 14.2 i reckon it is into our second battery which is over this side it's not in the picture but that doesn't matter it pu pu puts it at about 14.2 but not for very long now this battery's been sitting here it hasn't been used so it's probably it's got some USB outlets and voltmeter and stuff, so it's got a little load on, it's got a little drain, so it's down to 12 and a half volts, which isn't ideal, which is why I'm, we're going to get to talking about this charger a bit more in a minute. Um, it's not ideal. So really, while well, we want to give it a good, decent charge, I would have thought for a couple hours at over 14 volts. But generally, it's only about 5 minutes, 10 minutes. It gets to a state of charge. You can read the book on the projector unit, this thing here. You can go Google it, whatever. Um, I'll tell you what it's called actually, since we're talking about it. Where, where's the box? I don't know. Can't find it. I'll, ha I'll get it out. Let me finish what I'm saying. I'll show you what that is if you don't know. But this drops it down to about 13.5. So all day long, I'm looking at what's been put into the second battery, because I've got the display for that as well, and it's telling me 13.5. And I'm going, wow. So it's kind of like a downgrade. Now, you might talk about the amps and whatever, but I think, you know, Depending how many amps you put in voltages, it's a, it's a bit relative also. So if you've got 13.8 coming out of your alternator, and then your second battery is only getting 13.5, to me that's a downgrade. Okay, so it's a bit of a charge downgrade. So I'm not sure personally how good having a DC DC charger like that. That's the projector one. Of course, you know, you can get the, a lot of people have got the uh, red arc one, that's the BCDC 1225D, you know, Australian made. That's obviously one of these, like so. Okay. So whichever one you've got, they work very similarly, if not the same. Okay. 
and I'm just not sure about how much better they are or if they're better than having an SBI 12 and a voltage booster diode, okay? I'm just really not sure about that. So you want to do some homework. I don't, I don't want to say wait around, let's see what happens with this because I'm going to do, we change a lot of things. It's, it's hard to do, that. you've got to do this on your own vehicle, okay? So you can't, I can't monitor every client's vehicle that comes in to see what's happening with their, you know, you've got to be driving the car, using the car, parking there, running the fridges, you gotta be you gotta be all over it, you gotta put time into it, like what we're doing now. So I'm not that excited, okay? But I'll tell you what I do like, okay? What I really like about this unit in particular, and of course the other one, because it's got the solar, you know, it's got the solar uh, what do you call it? With MPPT solar regulator, right? So and that's what I was saying earlier with the solar panels. These regulate the solar much better. This is what we found. When it's too, when those panels get hot and nothing's happening with those other regulators, we come and plug it in direct to this, and bada bing, bada boom, it's charging, mate. The way it's meant to. We're seeing 14 volts, right? So we don't see that when we're driving. We only see 13.5 volts with this to the to the second battery over here. But when it's on solar, it's 14.2 or something, more or less, even higher. All day, every day. I'm talking looking at the voltmeter in the back of the car, you know, off the second battery. So even, you know, there's not much voltage drop in that anyway, so let's not go there. So how do you get the solar connected to this? Well, this has got to be wired up as per the instructions. Pretty simple. They talk about using an ignition wire. I can tell you, you don't need that. So we run this without it, and then we run it with it. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever, okay? This cuts in and out automatically, just like any other voltage-sensitive relay. I think they've planned for if you've got a low voltage... So if you have got a really variable alternator on some cars, which I don't know what they are because I don't work on them, but some vehicles in the recent years were designed that the alternator is virtually going to drop right down and cut out when the battery is charged to save fuel, you know, efficiency and all that. And they had special better batteries for all that as well. They had, you know, better cranking batteries over here at this side to go with those types of alternators. Now, this vehicle doesn't do that, so you don't need that wire, okay? Um, you can hook it up if you like. I've hooked it up just to see. I thought maybe it's going to help it disconnect as well. But I haven't seen that happen either. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Still in testing at the moment. Now, with the solar, you use, you take an earth and you take the solar wire. What I've done, we've got a little setup here, which I did, I think I showed you in another video. There's our Anderson plug for the solar, right? So if we want to, um, if we're out camping and we want to plug in the solar, you know, we could set this up somewhere so we don't have to open the bonnet, but I'm happy to open the bonnet, let the heat out, have a look at things, check things, whatever the case may be, and you just plug your solar straight into there, no regulator needed, and this unit regulates it really well. I'm really impressed with how the projector unit regulates the solar. So, if you're going to put permanent solar panels on your roof, if that was you and it does suit you, you're going to need something like that unit there, right? Now, with this way I've done this plug here, it's easy just, it just sits right there. It's just beautiful, right? So, and it's all, you know, corrugated split tubing on all the positives. Always corrugated split tubing. We can actually, you can't see, but stick it out through the front grill here because it's quite open on these um, later 150 GX Prados. I'm not sure if the GXL is just as wide. I haven't, most cars have got bull bars, so you don't get to see too much or, you know, don't take any notice, everything's in the way, whatever, but... There's quite an opening in the grill here and you can actually stick it through there. You could mount it permanently so you don't have to open the bonnet. I'm happy to open the bonnet. Now, obviously on this unit, you can press, it automatically selects your battery type, AGM, whatever the case may be, or gel or whatever. You can change modes. So sometimes it's more suitable with these to not use the AGM mode to put it on one. There's four different modes. I'm not gonna tell you, I can't remember at the moment what it is. It might, it might be gel actually, because it gives you a higher, yeah. Anyway, read the book. It's all in the book anyway, right? So if you're going to run Optimus, this in this one we've got a Century Dual Force, right? So we're just running it on um, the standard thing at the moment. What's it called? A AGM. And of course we've got the quality K on bracket. Look how neat that is. It's rock solid. You just take this trim off. It mounts straight on a couple of bolts. It's just the perfect place for it, guys. You can see it's out of the way. It's got the airflow to keep it cool. So I highly recommend the Kaon bracket. There are some other brands of brackets out there. In my opinion, Kaon is the best. The quality, it's right there. Easy to fit, bolt straight up. There's some other ones. There's all these pieces, nuts and bolts. More things to come loose. Contraption. This is three bolts. Bolt straight in. Right? I do like this projector charger. It's nice and neat. 
Look, I've got to say, I mean, this is probably a made in China thing, you know. It's Brown Watson that, you know, get all the projector and Nava stuff made and call it Nava and projector. But it's generally pretty good quality stuff. Um, the finish on it looks good. Now, the BC, BC1225D from Red Arc, it's Australian made and all that. And it looks solid and it's a steel case on the outside. But sometimes the quality doesn't look, you know, because it is Australian made. So the quality of the finish, it's kind of kind of not as good. But I don't think that takes away from the unit. Now, I hope you understand that's helped with the solar charging side of it, having one of these. So even if you didn't have, you know, have it set up for your batteries and you just had solar panels on your roof just to go to your second battery, I would run one of these, okay? So I'd just run straight from your solar into this and this to your second battery, even if your engine's not charged. I don't know why you'd do that. If you got one of these, you might as well do it. Because one thought, I suppose, is to save money, you could put in an auxiliary battery, right? Or even not have it, you could have it in the back of the car and you just want to connect it on solar. Even if you've got an auxiliary battery sitting there and solar, wise to have one of these because I don't know if I spat it out yet. I know I've said a lot, but... This solved the problem with the solar, okay? So when the panels got too hot and they dropped down to 13.2, 13.3 with those other regulators, we tried lots of things to solve the problem. We tried cooling them down, we tried putting them in the shade and then back in the sun, all sorts of things. What worked was plugging one of these in, okay? Just plug it direct into that and we had the voltage there. Same panels, different regulator, totally different result, okay? And none of those small cheap regulators did the job. It was this sucker here. And we're gonna to get to testing that BCDC1225D as well. I think they're much of a muchness whether you use this or, or the other one. Whatever you choose, whatever you prefer, the brand or the price, I get my stuff from every battery holder, bag, as I keep saying. Now, this charger over here, on this vehicle at the moment, as I said, it does come with a little connector with some eye terminals. So they're both connected to the top of this battery. You can't see one at each side. And we just leave that sitting there just sitting there and if we because this vehicle the fridges hasn't got the fridges in it yet we're still waiting on the storage system to be built but the type of fridges they're drawer fridges I'm going to show you those once they're done but you can't plug them on 240 volt they're 12 volt only so most likely they're going to get turned off when they're not in use um, therefore we won't really need to run a, per, a charger like this okay um, but what we've done is we've put the connection there so that we can easily just okay here it is it's parked here We've got too many Prados here and we've got other transportation as well. So while it's parked here, we can just easily plug that in like that. Right, that's, I mean, it's just a clip. You can see there, there it is as a clip. Then you just grab your, you know, I happen to have, you know, a few power leads hanging around. So you just grab your power lead and plug it in. And as we would say, bada bing, bada boom. And what did I say? When it's charging at the start, you got that red light there. And then it'll go to green. So this was down a little bit. It hasn't been run or charged. So I'll just leave that on charge anyway. Because um, that's what it's there for. And the way this system works, right? So that's charging the cranking battery. Because the cranking battery sitting there not getting used. It's not really that happy either. It wants to be full. Let me remind you, in case I didn't mention it already. The best way to keep a battery is full. That means keep it full. That means don't cycle it. Because if it's getting cycled, it's not full anymore, is it? It's called sulfation, okay? Just think of it like a cancer, it's just eating your battery, it's eating the... How can I explain it? Just keep your battery full, that means keep it full. You know all the cars that you come in and you turn everything off and the lights stay on, follow me home lighting and all these lights? That's kind of running your battery down a bit. Don't sit there for two minutes or five minutes or... Don't sit there with the lights on and whatever and then get out of your car. If you've got a small battery in these some of these small cars, it's just running your battery down, it's going to reduce the life of your battery. Now, they probably don't want me to tell you that because they want to sell you another battery as well, right? So, anyway, chargers. We've talked about the isolator that I would use, the SBI-12. If you want a DC-DC charger, we talked about the two that I'd use, the bracket that we'd use. With all your connections, you know, we showed you in our other video with our dual battery setup. Everything's got to be fused, close as possible to the battery. See the positive? This is the only area that hasn't got split corrugated tubing, right? Because there's nothing for it to rub on. I want to know that it's red and positive. It's a quality connection there, well crimped, insulated, nice and tight, not going there. There's a fuse right here, same deal, insulated at both ends, heat shrink, you know, like it, awesome connection, but it's just going to help any, let's say the connection vibrator loose somehow, or even the heat shrink, because there's a bit of a ridge, it's going to help hold it all together. And straight from here downwards, we've got double insulated wire anyway, so. 
Um, you don't need to corrugate or split tubing your black ones because the whole vehicle's earth, not worried about that. It's the red. Any red wire, they're the ones you want insulated. So we've covered this charger, what that's for. We've covered your, your two options, your red arc or your projector there. We've told you you can get it from every battery if you like. Kaon, you know, on their website or eBay, I'm sure, probably their website better to get these brackets, BC, DC, 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 what do you call it, charger bracket. There's a couple of different models depending which Prado you've got, you know, 150 or the different 151. Um, what else can I tell you about chargers? Um, that's what we found. I really just wanted to share that because you go and spend this money putting one of these in and as I said, it's really good for the solar, so it really, you can't live without it. But the disadvantage is, okay, so, Let's say this battery over here dies, right? It's just a standard battery that came with the vehicle. We go on a, we come down the Tanami, shake it to pieces, you know, it breaks a couple of plates or something. We stop at the end to air up the tyres, switch the car off or whatever. Probably shouldn't because the compressor's running and you want maximum voltage to that so that it works better as well. But anyway, we did, we switched it off. We decided we're having lunch, I don't know, whatever. Turn the car off, go to restart it again. She's dead, not happening. Well, all right. We've got a perfectly good battery over this side, right? We've got a massive big Century Dual Force 90 amp hour AGM that's perfectly capable of crank starting the car, but we can't connect the batteries. This charger here doesn't allow for that. There's no button on it to say, hey, can you please connect these two batteries? Even though the wires we've used are sufficient, please put it in the comments if I'm wrong, but I'm just like, this is silly what is going on here you know so what you really need to do is carry a piece of red probably 6 bns or 4 bns something really big and thick you know this is i think this was 8 bns this wire here that'd almost do it but probably not i wouldn't try it right um i think that was 8 bns oh yeah because this was something a bit smaller again but anyway you just want something decent like like you know jump cables type thing something you can get you know a few hundred amps through not 100 amp probably two three four hundred ideally um you could just carry a, a red length of wire with a eye terminal on each end if you've got a connection and if that did happen then you could just pull that out where it was you might even even tuck down here next to your battery somewhere and you just connect it onto here to that because they're both earth the negative the blacks earth to the vehicle you don't need to run that wire it's already done you just connect the red wire to connect the two batteries together and you can jump. So that's your way around it, but it's something else you've got to do or you've got to think about or you've got to have someone else with you or you've got to have an Optima over here because ah, then it's going to be reliable. It's not going to go flat. It's not going to break and fall to pieces. So things to think about, guys. Um, batteries we've talked about. Solar we've talked about. But look, just having the solar on the roof isn't going to suit a lot of people because, as I said, it's going to get dirty. It's going to get, you know what on it, bird crap on it. Um, it's going to get leaves. I think it's really the view is going to get blocked. Unless you're, you're going to be up there cleaning all the time. I don't know how they're going to go in sun long term. Just like solar panels on house roofs, I don't know how they're going to go. But I don't know whether they're as good as those or not. If they're designed for full-time work. Look, I don't think that's the go. Personally, the best dual battery setup would probably be to use Optimus, probably to use a Red Arc. If you've got batteries under the bonnet close together, using the Red Arc SBI-12, using the voltage booster diode, using the right size wires, quality connection, do it yourself so you know where everything goes. There is definitely a place for DC-DC chargers. We're just going to use it all loosely, BC, DC, or DC, whatever. What that means is it's a 12 volt charger. That means it charges, uh, it's a charger for your car, right? You know, we'll call, this is an AC charger, right? We'll just call them DC chargers. An AC, this is an AC, that's a DC, right? The, this one here, DC, and the red up one's a DC. Of course, you can get those brands with an AC charger as well. You can get a red up, I'm sure you can get a red up AC charger. Well, I'm not sure actually, so I shouldn't say that, should I? I'm not sure, but I'd assume you'd be able to do it. Just like you can get, what's that other brand? C-Tech, you can get C-Tech DC chargers or AC. Anyway, um, I was telling you what the best set it was. Optimus, SBI-12, voltage booster diode. I like it because you can jump start your two batteries, they're close together. If you have batteries in a caravan or something like that, 
that's where your DC charger might keep come in because of the length over the distance voltage drop now you can run some massive wires and that'll help with the problem it certainly will but it all adds to weight and money also so I wouldn't do that if you're running a trailer if your battery is right on the front of the draw bar like a camper trailer you could probably run some uh, you know uh, 6 BNS to that it's right at the front you're not going to lose much voltage it's going to do the job if you're going further back into a caravan camper and you've got wiring everywhere that's where you definitely certainly want some sort of charger like this because what it does let's just put it simple it's the amplifier right so it takes you a little bit of charge and it juices it up and makes it something bigger to charge that battery properly okay so that's where they're good and that's where they're needed and that's where people talk about and think these are needed because they think the alternators are charging low but they're just not charging that low this vehicle here 2019 it charges at 13.8 volts most of the time when I look at it as I said that's perfectly this is what you just got to get your facts right the fact of the matter is the alternator in this vehicle is sufficient to charge this battery right here right we can agree on that that's what the manufacturer did they know what they're doing it's Toyota even 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 other manufacturers know how to do that right so of course adding another battery you can just add another battery and put an SBI 12 and when it gets to that voltage it connects it's going to charge both the batteries I'm telling you it's going to do it's going to do the job anyway right now if you've got an alternator that drops down to 13 volts well it's still going to do the job it's just not going to do it real well but if it was a voltage sensing alternator sort of thing that varied depending on the voltage well if the two are connected together and it's charging two it's not going to get the voltage it wants and drop down until later on so I'm telling you it's still going to work on these Prados it's still going to work by not even having a voltage booster diode so it's your choice what charge I know it's confusing because they've both got advantages and it's real it's really it's a hard one for me because like I said love this for the solar I love how neat it is I just love the look of it I love the theory of it how that's going to charge better but I don't like looking at 13.5 volts I've got to be honest I don't like it I don't like I can't just connect the wire and jump start the car but that being said, I've never had the main cranking battery go flat. And it's probably not going to happen to anyone. Check your batteries. Don't try and get too long out of them. Here's another little fact. The average life of a battery is four years. That's kind of like the average life of a battery, right? These Toyota batteries, they're ridiculous. I see they've made them smaller. The old ones, I was bringing them out of cars seven years old. It was ridiculous. Those GSU Usa, what do you call them, I think? Yeah, GSU Usa, there you go. Best batteries you can get. Just crazy. For someone that's on road, you don't need to change your batteries, okay? Optimas are for people doing trips and using it as a full drive. If you've just got a car, you go to the shops and back, school and back. These batteries are fine. You just keep it that way. When you call every battery, you say, can I please have one of those Panasonics? You know, they're white with a black top. It looks just like the UASA. Because I don't know, I reckon Panasonic makes it for the UASA or UASA make it for Panasonic. Or they copy each other or they're together. A bit like the Toyota 86 and the... Subaru BRZ, you know, one makes it and they use the, you know, same thing, different name, you know, like all the other cars, the GQ Patrol and the Maverick and it went on for years and then they said they couldn't do it anymore or something like that. I don't know what the rule was, but Toyota and Subaru did it years ago, didn't they? So it's still happening. Lots of cars like that. Another subject, but, um, so it's a bit of a doozy. What do you do? Which one do you go for? Well, the cheaper option is the SBI 12. And the voltage boost diode and you can jump start that's your reliable setup um, if your batteries aren't on it probably that's the way to go but you kind of want this solar input you know this is the problem so here we go we've got that we've got a charging system but i want the jump starting so you miss out one way or the other so we either need an sbi 12 system with a solar charging output or we need a jump starting system with this where we can press a button I'm sure there is another, I'm not sure actually, I won't say that, but I'm pretty sure there was other models of projector, even the basic 100 amp, you know, voltage sensitive relay things that were about 100 bucks or something, you could press a button on them and it would connect the battery so you could do a jump start, right? So am I missing something? Please put in the comments if this model, I should tell you what it is. I'm going to take a break again. I think we've pretty well covered batteries, charges, solar a little bit. We've got a little bit more to go. We're just going to recap on a couple of things and I'm going to show you what model of projector unit this is and we'll finish up. Right, so this is the unit so you can see model numbers and whatever. Although you can't see too much, can you? Because of that, the way the light is. You can't, you can't even read that, can you? Terrible. Three stage, 25 amp. 
is what it says. Um, that's your projector IntelliCharge, DC solar battery charger. Now, so what I suppose I didn't mention is what's good about this is if you are that person that wants to have permanent solar panels on your roof and more likely usable on your caravan, and we touched on that with other things of this having this charger there for those reasons, but certainly this is what you need if you want to be able to have an automatic system where you can have solar hooked up. So as soon as you switch your car off, solar's charging. As soon as you start it up, that overrides the solar. So it's definitely getting charged one way or the other and it's all fully automatic. This is what you want in both your caravan. When I say this, you can have this or you can have the Red Arc. Either one, mate. I'm not... Either way. Look, I like Red Arc. It's Australian made stuff, right? So I do like that. I do like the kind of finish on this, you know what I mean? So... But maybe the internals of the Red Arc are better. Up to you to work out. That's your decision. Um, so that's the model, what we've got in there. Um, I think it's actually... I'm not sure if it's gel or calcium. One of those you put it on instead of AGM if you got Optimus. But it's in the book. Read these books and you'll know more than me. You probably do already, so there you go. Let's have a look at the uh, the 120, the SB, I thought it was called an SB112, but I know they're called SBI12s now, but they might have changed because they got a bit smarter as well with alternators, perhaps. So let's have a look at that and this wire that I'm talking about and how it connects the two batteries together. Yeah, before we do that, I just want to show you. So we've got this projector charger on charging the main cranking battery. And you can see the red light's on. Uh, it's not really getting warm yet. It's only been on for probably half an hour. The current light's showing here. It just says alternator. Now, if we plug solar in, you can see that. You can't probably see that well, but the next one is the, the light would come on for solar. And um, I don't know why it says alternator there, really, because there's nothing coming from the alternator. So I, I, re I don't get that, but... They should have no lights on. So, you know, and it's also, see that other one, it flashes every now and then? Oh no, it's on, there you go, that one's on. So that's gonna use power, and that's what I'm saying. This is another negative about one of these units. There is a drain on this battery because this unit is there doing its thing. Now, what I wanna show you is though, eventually, when this battery gets to voltage, this is gonna cut in and start charging the second auxiliary battery over here. So let's go and have a look at the 120 and that wire I wanted to show you, and then we'll come back to this and uh, see if the situation's changed and you'll be able to see what lights are on. Okay, so as you've seen before, we've got the cranking optima there and the accessory battery here. The latest addition is this little Bluetooth battery monitor. We've got a little app on the phone and you can have a look and see what your voltage is, which is pretty handy whether you're near the car at home and you just want to check what it is. You know, it might be one of those days where you're wondering whether you should plug the charger in or put the solar out. More to the point at camp. You'd be sitting there, might be beer o'clock, and you're kind of like, should I chuck the solar on for the last couple of hours of sun? You can just grab the phone, whatever, because you might have it near you. Obviously not for Facebook, but so that you can uh, take photos. It'll be only near you for taking photos if you're out on a trip, but you can also check. Anyway, the SB, I thought it was the SB112, but hard to see because it's dark down there, but that's the unit there. It's just, it's in my hand, right? That's it, that's how small it is. Two terminals on the top, right? A lot of people, there's a wire that comes off it, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it's blue. I don't know if you can see it down there. You can see the blue wire, there you go. You can see the unit. On the side there, that lights up when the two batteries are connected, so I'm going to show you in a minute. That blue wire, a lot of people run it inside in the car and you've got to find a positive to get it to... All that. So therefore, if you had a flat battery, you've got to hold that button while you turn the key and stuff like that. I just reckon that's too complicated and I might be under here and I want to connect the two, so this is how it was when I got it and I didn't change it. Great idea, I reckon, see? That's just your um, blue wire and they put a you know, and you just basically watch what I'll show you what happens. You watch it light up, right? See that? Right. It's not staying connected because it's not meant to, right? Okay, so you know when it's connected and when it's not. Uh, it's connect, staying connected now. There you go. <laughs> yeah, the reason it's staying connected is for a minute it will probably drop off. There it goes. 
because it's right on the edge, right? That's the thing. So this battery here, it's probably about the, you know, 12.7 or 8 or 9 or whatever it is, wherever this wants to cut out. So if I want them to be connected, so where's my charging wire? On this one, that other charger, so there's my solar. On this one, there's the solar input because I use one of those dodgy chargers and see what I mean about the quality of the wires, not so good, they just go all... Anyway, that's my Anderson plug that goes to the battery. And you can see there's my other little wire for when I want to charge using... Well, I actually don't use use that on this vehicle anymore because I've got that charger mounted in the back. I'll show you that. But that's what I used to use. So there it is there. Um, yeah, pretty simple stuff. I hope you get what I mean. Um, I think this is, like I said, big thick cables. Let's have a look, right? So here it comes around to the battery. The positive, it's inside the corrugator split tube, so you can't see it, but it's a good size and I haven't I can't show you any of it that's not inside the corrugated split tubing but certainly if I want to jump say say for some reason this battery died or whatever or went flat because I left the door open all night which I still don't think it's gonna go flat because it's a good battery I'll just come out here and I go put that there two become one and then I go and start the car and then at my leisure whenever I want I'll just take that back off and I'll just I'll just sit it there like that you know it's not going anywhere and of course there's a fuse there, that's the wire for the power that goes to the back of the car. One single wire all the way to the back, and it's been like that for the life of the vehicle since 2008. Running fridges and lights and everything, no problem. Alright guys, hope that's helped. I don't know what else we can say, I'll have a think about anything I've missed and uh, recap if we need to. Just sort of quickly show you where, so obviously we've got the storage system, we've got the fridge, we've got our temperature and fridge temperature. And if you look at the side of the storage system there, you can see that charger mounted there. Just two screws. You can see the plug there into the power board. And the fridge ones below it. I'll show you what I mean about reliable, okay? So I'm just going to pull this the fridge out. You can see the wire. There's my two wires. They're on the side of the tray, where they've been, and that's where they're going to stay. Now, the wire... It's pretty dark there, I know you can't see, I didn't bring a light. There's my wire in corrugated split tubing. It's zip tied onto a flexi strap on the back there, so it gives a little bit if I pull it too much. That's maxed out, you don't want any spare wire there. Um, but it goes, you probably can't see it, but there's a hole about halfway along the fridge travel. Because obviously that's where you want it halfway. Because your fridge, that way coming out is halfway. And then it's the same distance to go all the way in, right? So, I don't know if you know what I mean with that anyway. Just so you know, storage system, you can fit another 20 litre water container up the side there. Which is quite handy and still fit all this other stuff and more in there as well. Just thought I'd show you that anyway. Reliability. And of course, a few power outlets there. We've got a couple there. And um, over here we've got a couple USBs and a few more here. It's all dark anyway, so... Let's get out of here. Okay, so back to this vehicle for a minute. You can see the charge is on. It's actually warming up a little bit. It's humming now. We're gonna have a look what the lights are doing. Charging. So not the solar. Charging. Okay, so that's cool. So this charger is charging this battery. And once it gets to a certain voltage, as demonstrated right here, regardless of ignition being on or not, this will oh, stop charging for a minute. What's going on there? It's going off. Interesting. What's happening there? Let's just watch that for a minute. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see if that, maybe I've got a bad connection here because it's still no, it's still showing charging the red lights on at this end so that would have to mean there's a load at the other end because if we disconnect I'll just let's just do a bit of testing right here now I'll unplug the battery hard to do with one hand actually I'm finding out this is why putting phones in yeah no can't do it one-handed yeah, we've got power back at this end, okay, so this is what it's going to look like. Probably what's happening actually, it's going to cut in and out a bit, because 
this, it's a very, it's just a slow charger, remember, right? So although it's given it a bit of a boost at the moment until it gets up to X, whatever the book says, um, this gets up to a certain level, then it kicks in. The charging will start after approximately two minutes. That's why it's showing alternator, right? It thinks, it's not the alternator, but because the voltage is increased at that end, it's saying we're getting input from the alternator and after approximately two minutes, this charging light will start flashing and that's what must have been happening because it was happening, you saw it. Um, so if you want, we can hang around for two minutes. But what will happen, that charging light will start flashing but then perhaps after an amount of time, I'm not sure how long, the um, whole thing cuts out because it's like it's dropped again because this isn't kind of like charging this battery enough if you know what I mean but this uh, this one will eventually catch up and get that to a level where it'll be consistently being able to stay connected with this staying connected charging to charge this battery as well so while we're waiting for that I'll just keep an eye on that just want to go through, uh, over a couple other things just to mention um, and I did say earlier everything needs to have a fuse on it so you can see the positive wire there that's the only one that comes around here to the charger this one here i showed you just here where the um solar is that positive there the negative comes from an earth but the positive there's a on this k-on bracket here this stainless steel bracket that the charger's mounted on there's a little spot to mount a fuse let me see if i get this light down here you'll be able to see it shine the light down in there you can see the fuse it's actually a fuse holder as part of the bracket what an awesome idea right eh? so you can see the green comes up from the bottom of the charger the green is the solar makes sense doesn't it green for solar i've just used red heat shrink a fuse and into red because obviously i wasn't going to buy green wire to use um, about six inches of wire there it is it's charging again i'll just get the light out the way so you can see that that's what's happening you can see the charging light flashing on and off so it's charging so right now the voltage of that second battery would be up so let's quickly go to the vehicle before it cuts out let's see what we got there it is as I said 14.3 is the first stage but it's probably going to cut out I reckon I was going to say I reckon it cut out because it went 14 too but there you go around four, there it is it's dropping down now so we've lost it so that's what's happened there so same as if um, the engine was started I suppose this would steady it off I suppose what, what am I trying to say to you it doesn't really matter okay it doesn't matter basically yeah that, that's gone off again not enough gigawatts right so it's probably going to stay off I think it's probably a, a timed thing it's probably 30 seconds or a minute and um, that'll just come back on again. It'll get the alternate, little alternator light will come on first. So it's gonna do that for a while. So all good anyway. Either way, this is charging this battery. Once this one gets to enough voltage, this connects, all right, which is not at the moment. And then that, there it is. It hasn't connected yet. In about two, two minutes from now it is, I think. That will then charge this for a little bit. So ideally, if you want to maintain your auxiliary battery, if you've got a fridge running, you want to have this wire, as we've got it on the other vehicle, directly to your auxiliary battery. Um, why do we do it this way? Probably because we want to be able to charge both and make sure this one's um, all happy as well. But I'm not sure really. Yeah, because we had with the other one, we can use the SB um, isolated connector to battery. So we could have this wire with a plug here for this charger connected on this battery and we could override it to charge both we can't do that with this system with this charger so if we had that it would only charge this battery which is good but i want to be able to top up this one so although it's cutting in and out at the moment what's going to happen if this gets left on and i will come back to you with another video where i'll confirm that after a certain amount of time this will just stay on this charging will stay on and then this charger will be charging that that battery there through this will be charging and both batteries will be charging 
happy days just on maintenance trickling away could be wrong and we'll find out all right guys i reckon that's it for this video that's about everything i've got for you on batteries charges make sure you've got your fuses there um, what batteries to use where you can get them get them wherever you want but like i said the guys at every battery good information fair pricing that's who we use so that's just our choice and i've set it up so if you ring up and say anthony said to call anthony prado or i'm from oz prado career anthony said you know you'll be able to make, recommend a battery or whatever and you ship them out to me i'm i'm in canberra or whatever i'm sure that i will look after you and do that all right guys thanks for watching if you haven't already subscribe this may not have been the video for you but this is the video a lot of people ask for they wanted to get my thoughts on solar and charges and isolators and batteries and solar panels and all that sort of thing so i hope that's helped let me know thanks see ya ciao bye bye see ya